Hi, this is Pat Moorhead with More Insights and Strategy, and I am here with my co-host, Daniel Newman of Futurum Research, and we are here for an exciting episode of a 6.5 Live Insider podcast. And if you're not familiar with those, the we, in, we interview and talk to the most influential people in the technology industry. Daniel Newman, how are you? Hey, good morning, Pat. Always excited to have these kinds of conversations. Uh, and this is going to be a good one. This is a guest that we've had before, but on a completely different topic. So, uh, you know, we're going to be talking a little bit about AI ethics. We're going to be talking a little bit about uh, advertising. And, you know, you and I as tech guys, we, we cover a really wide swath. But this is a topic I'm really excited and interested for. And I know we got to bring him on the show, but Pat, why don't you do all the, you know, the have to do's? Sure, sure. Uh, just a reminder, uh, we do talk about public companies, uh, but please don't take any of this as investment advice because this show is for informational and educational purposes only. Uh, typically, uh, the 6-5 stands for six topics, five minutes each. Uh, sometimes go a little bit longer. It's not about news. This is about the meaning and the importance of, of technology. Uh, but without further ado, let's introduce our guest, Bob Lord, Senior Vice President at IBM of Worldwide Ecosystems. Bob, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing well. Thank you guys for having me back. Yeah, absolutely. It was it was a lot of fun the uh, the first time. Uh, I know we hit you up at the very end to do another one, and, and look at this. Uh, uh, here we are. But uh, why don't we uh, jump right in and Bob, let's talk about what you do for for IBM, uh, and and maybe we can talk uh, a little bit about the topic at hand. Yeah. So guys, I have two roles, and last time we talked mostly about the ecosystem and the work we're doing with Call for Code. Um, and the great work we're doing there around partners and the open ecosystem. I also have another, wear another hat in the company, and it's to oversee the weather company and the Watson advertising business, which is in the media marketing landscape. For those of you who click on your, even your iPhone, or uh, you try to get weather every day, we're fueling all that information that you get underneath that. So it's actually a really, really exciting business. Um, and we're going through a major transformation right now about how you actually attract audiences and what you do with audiences. And that's the topic that we're gonna to discuss today. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Bob, and a great topic. It's something that we're pretty excited about. You know, we had a chance to talk to you in the background a little bit about what's going on here. And, you know, I wanted to kind of start out with you talking about the overall advertising space, <laughs> IBM Watson, um, you know, the inherent bias that exists. You know, these are all things that are sort of, uh, you know, coming more and more into attention and I was, I was kind of wondering if you could kind of give us a brief background. Why did this become an issue with the acquisition, with your role in the weather company? How frequently is this showing up and, and what's uh, kind of IBM doing right now? So I think what's what's actually really interesting right now in the media and marketing landscape <clears throat> is people are not using AI at scale yet. <clears throat> and they haven't really embraced it at the level that I think they need to. Now, I've been here at IBM for six years and I've seen AI transform countless industries. Uh, whether it's from financial services to healthcare to cybersecurity uh, to insurance. Um, and what it is, is it's using basic AI machine learning and basic AI principles to provide insight to business owners so that they can make better decisions. And we can come back and talk about that. But think about what's happening right now in how there's lots of controversy around identifying and engaging audiences within the marketing and media landscape. You hear about it every day about whether people want to be, you know, tracked, which they don't want to be. Um, I believe actually in what AI allows is real-time optimization and a better value exchange between a brand and a consumer than we've ever been able to see before. But that's going to mean that the media marketing landscape is going to have to embrace AI. The secondary benefit, and, and uh, Daniel, you were talking about this, is I truly believe that if we apply AI principles appropriately, we can actually root out the inherent biases that exist in the marketing landscape today. And quite honestly, have, have been in the industry for decades, for decades, and we all grew up on segmentation, pricing, promotion, all inherited in that is bias. And we believe, and I have seen, uh, at least for the initial research we've done, that we can actually root out biases and make are advertising much more appropriate to our consumers than ever before? Yeah, so Bob, we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, I think we've established that it's an issue, but 
I think uh, the next question is what what is being done about it in in the industry? Well, I think that's so I think, Patrick, that's really, really the challenge right now. OK, um, I think we have an opportunity. You all have heard about uh, some of the rumors around taking away cookies, which is really the primary way that people kind of advertise. They look backwards and they look at people's behaviors in the past and then they actually target that individual, obviously permission based. Um, based on past behavior. Um, we're going to move to the era where those cookies are going to go away, right? Some of the largest players in the industry have, have said that they're going to eliminate those things. So what does that mean? How do we actually create a value exchange between a brand and a consumer? The way that you can do that is you can do real-time optimization based on, obviously, again, permission-based, but real-time optimization at the moment in time, not only understanding where they are at that time, but also optimization on creative placement. And where we've been able to do that, we actually see a better conversion because you're much more relevant to the consumer and what their needs are at that moment in time versus what we used to do in the past. And then therefore this is, is the opportunity. Now, the second piece to that, because we know we start out with a, a gross segmentation, it's already biased based on the fact that we've started with that segmentation and the cohort groups. But you can actually optimize against the AI to root out the biases that are coming through, similar to what we've done, let's say, in the insurance industry, where we root out biases around underwriting for approvals for insurance rates. Or in the financial services era, we root out biases around mortgage approvals. You can do the same thing, and the AI can help you help the decision maker identify that maybe they're only advertising to a certain community um, and that they should be advertising to a broader community. So let me ask you a question. I just I, I want to follow up on that one a little bit. Why can why start with advertising? Because you mentioned a bunch of different examples, and so this is an area you're you're you guys are really zeroing in on, and it seems really interesting. But there's so many areas coming out here. What sort of drove you to come out hot and heavy around advertising? Well, look, I think it's I I, I think it's the opportunity right now, um, Daniel. That we're going to rebase how we do marketing because as cookies go away and digital tracking goes away and is mandated, we have the opportunity to do advertising bias free in the future. But that means we have to basically build that into the processes that we all love and cherish today as marketers. OK, we know that segmentation leads to cohort groups. We know that if we do segmentation properly, we're going to get a very high return on our click-through rates, let's say, or our conversions, right? But those conversions ultimately optimize and they sub-optimize among every, every, over and over again. So if I, I put out a, hypo a hypothesis, right? It's bias exists in advertising today and we can use AI to identify it and attempt to mitigate it. So it's ripe right now with the changes that are happening in the advertising industry to build these processes into it as we move forward into the future. And that's why we're laser focused on this right now. Yeah, it, make, it makes a lot of sense. I just wanted to point that out because as you were giving examples, I'm thinking, you know, this is definitely something that, that people care a lot about. But all these are things that people care about. And, and every one of these different industries, financial and healthcare, and different ways that you could be applying this. And I'm guessing you guys are working on all this, which kind of drums me up to the next question, which is about research and partnerships. So, you know, you guys have been doing a lot of research. You've been you've been collecting data. This was this didn't come out of nowhere. Um, you know, you, you've been uh, delivering and, and, and coming into market with new partnerships. Talk a little bit about the research that sort of fueled this effort behind, uh, you know, putting advert, uh, bias and, and moving it in, uh, putting it, removing bias in advertising, and then some of the partnerships that you've established to sort of help move this along quicker. Yeah. So, look, I, I think, you know, the, the what I've learned at IBM is a scientific method, right? It came back to me uh, as I got older here, but I learned it in college and it comes back here. But there's, you, you always start out with a hypothesis and then you do research around it. So last year we engaged IBM Research with a colleague of mine, Dario Gill, who is the Senior Vice President and Director of Research here at IBM. It's one of the storied organizations. It's probably one of the most fascinating organizations I think in the world. Um, but now we have over 20 plus people engaged in this work, including our best PhDs, researchers who authored on and published on multiple AI topics around this and specifically around bias. So they've done it for other industries and now I'm just pointing them towards advertising. Um, and we prior prioritize that the team be very diverse in terms of demographics and experience because that's part of the problem we're trying to get at also, right? 
you don't want the you don't want the researchers to be biased even before we start the research itself. Um, so we have ad tech engineers, we have advertising strategists, we have data scientists, um, we have AI specialists, and then we have shareholders across the ecosystem. So one of the partners we brought in was the Ad Council, right? Everyone knows the Ad Council. They probably do the best job at really trying to get advertising more ubiquitous and bias-free than anyone else. And we've taken their data set. We've leveraged some of our open source tools, and we've taken their data set to see if their advertising in this last campaign has been biased. And guess what? It's biased. You know, because you start out with a particular segment and you refine around that segment. We, we did a program with them. Um, it's up to your COVID uh, vaccine campaign. It was educating people around the campaign. And what happened was the tools that we currently have today, when they started out with a very large universe, based on the criteria that they put about how they wanted to contact people, they sub-optimized themselves and they never rooted out that bias. So they ended up advertising to a particular cohort group because they were getting a better conversion there. When in actuality, there's other cohort groups that really needed to be educated and they needed to target against those cohort groups. So it's unintentional bias. If we build our tools in to those programs, you're gonna be able to highlight those things going forward. Now, where are we in the stage is your other question. We're just doing the research, right? I am asking advertisers to give me a look into their campaigns, have them come forward so we can look at IBM's open source tools and see where the biases exist. That'll give us an indication of what kind of tool sets we need to build to build into our targeting process as we go forward. And we, you know, IBM, you know, I'm not gonna come out with a tool that everyone's gonna use. This is gonna be a tool that can be used across the industry and built in to a lot of the targeting tools that are out there today. We're starting to talk to, you know, the likes of our partners with Adobe, uh, with Magnus. We're starting to talk to some of the agencies about how they could use these tools going forward. And there's been a great reception around it so far. So Bob, um, IBM is one of the few companies left that actually does real research. And I've always been a proponent. I really try to educate people that uh, R&D uh, is not the same thing. They're, they're two very different things. Uh, develop, development is really about productizing some of the research that, that has been done. And research is real research. It's You're not too sure if you'll ever get to monetize anything. And a lot of times it's done for, for the greater good. And IBM has a great um, uh, multi-decade uh, track record uh, for doing this. We were fortunate enough to talk with uh, Dario Gill on the, at the 6.5 Summit. Uh, 2021 and he went through uh, a lot of his his team's capabilities uh, i'm going to put you on the spot and ask you is there any any specific areas inside of ibm research that that your project and initiatives with bias and advertising are taking advantage of whether it's uh ai uh whether it's um uh code that that actually creates other code uh, is it, you know, quantum? Uh, what, what what types of things is it is it leveraging? Yeah, okay, so there's a couple of pieces. So even just let's stay on the bias topic for a minute and I'll talk yeah. to you a little bit about quantum because there's so much going on there. So, I mean, the great news about Dario's organization is we are one of the largest players in the AI space and he's been doing a lot of research for decades around AI. Um, he and the organization really have created this ethical and trusted approach across how to employ these technologies. And actually, two years ago at Davos, we launched the IBM Policy Lab. It's basically a global forum to foster trust and innovation around AI. What we found and the insight that they found was people weren't taking on AI because they didn't trust it. And yeah. what it really got down to was they didn't understand it, right? They didn't understand how the decisions were being made. And what Dario and the team did is almost took the black box and opened it up. Oh, interesting so that people could actually see how the decisions were being made. And now adoption has started to go forward. I mean, you can't, you know, from a, from a, a standpoint, we cannot let the machines just make the decisions. We have to be informed with the decisions and then decide whether or not those decisions should go forward. So the whole thrust of what he's been able to do is trustworthy AI, which I think is really, really an important piece, which now I'm leveraging in the advertising business. So I'm particularly working with those people. So all the research that they've done over those years, I'm morphing it and say, let's just point it towards advertising and see what kind of result we can get there. 
And that's that's the that I believe is sort of the credibility that I can bring into the marketing and media landscape based on what they've done before. You know, are we leveraging quantum in this project? Not yet. I mean, if you think about quantum, you know, quantum is going to be a complement to classical computing. Classical computing is being ones and zeros on and off, on and off, on and off. It's going to actually give us much more compute power than ever, ever before to have us to have us solve real problems. Now, what I could see happen here is one of the big things that this could help us with or quantum can help us with is the amount of data that we have to crunch, right? Because classical computing can only do so much data crunch crunching from an right. algorithmic standpoint. If we can actually, if we need to, if the data set gets big enough and we need to really, really crunch, we can actually then access quantum simulation and quantum computing to get some, some, uh, some insight into that. But it's still no, determined. You know, Bob, a lot of this conversation reminds me of the same types of conversations we had about uh, mortgage banking, uh, credit cards, and making sure that that we reduce uh, bias on things like that. And, you know, the conversation of of how to how to get inside the black box, really, even in financial, uh, the finance industry made deep learning an issue because you essentially can't audit deep learning now. Researchers are finding a way to do this, so they really came in and they focused in on on machine learning instead, which is uh, a, a lot more uh, auditable. But but f uh, fascinating stuff. It's it's you know what's so interesting is when you open up the black box, it's about how the decisions are being made, and are you in alignment? Does your is your business in alignment? You're the decision maker with those decisions that are being made, um, and then you can actually lever those decisions and make them more institutional. And I think that's really the balance that you have to have around you know being responsible in this world of artificial intelligence and decision making so bob i want to circle back here you you know you guys are obviously making progress you've you've driven this into some really great partnerships if you're successful in being able to remove bias from advertising you know what do you think are some of the the broader benefits obviously what pat just mentioned what he suggested with you know being able to get the right uh, you know, mortgage uh, to the right person, putting the right ad. You know, how does this scale? Do you see this applying into other AI-driven challenges and ethics around the world? Well, yeah. Look, so let's just let's just take that that question and piece it apart. I mean, the overall goal right now, I don't have a specific tool right to offer the industry. Right, we're still sort of in that research gathering place. I hope by the middle of the year, you know, towards the end of twenty two, we're going to have some tools that we want to share with people. But the goal right now, our overall goal is to minimize the impact of bias on consumers, on brands, campaigns. Kind of very focused, very s simplistic, right? While establishing new practices around campaign performance. Because if we don't insert ourselves into that campaign performance, the sub-optimization will continue to happen. So we have to have a check and balance about how the campaigns actually call them the flights, the media plans, whatever people call them, right? We have to insert ourselves there so that we have these flags that come up. The outcomes, you know, is, a, I hope, a scalable approach to bias identification and mitigation. That's the first thing. If I can have a scaled approach that's open source that everyone can take, I feel like we have a really good chance of creating an industry playbook um, for fairness in ad tech. Um, and I believe the ad tech players will come forward and embrace these kind of solutions. It'd be actually be another piece would just be to educate the industry and the marketing organizations, you know, that the legacy of pricing, promotion, you know, segmentation, the old processes have got to be changed and bias detection has to be right in the center of it, not only for the good of the world, right, and gets everyone else, but I believe that it is actually a better business value proposition. I think we're not advertising to consumer groups that need to be advertised to which opens up a really good economic equation for the brands. And then sometimes we're sub-optimizing sub and making it worse for consumer groups. Like, you know, in like a, I, I think they call it like the food desert, right? So let's say you have a CSR company or, a, you know, that fast food company and they're advertising. Well, you know what? Their advertising is much more effective in an underprivileged minority uh, or place because that's all the food that exists is fast food, they don't have any options. So therefore you continue to advertise in that area when actually in other areas, they can have a bigger portfolio and higher demographics and they probably could get a better return on their money. So those are the kinds of things, it's one or the other, but you've gotta, I believe that we um, 
I think educating people around this bias problem and how we can root it out um, is part of the part of the objective I've got right now. Bob, I know we're early in this and you're putting together the research. You did talk about starting off with a hypothesis, and I, I do appreciate your going back to the university uh, days. I mean, it's it's <laughs> even what I do 32 years later, but um, any types of metrics that, that say advertising could be 2x more effective, 20% more effective. I mean, listen, 10% more effective is is amazing uh, to begin with, but are we talking about order of magnitudes here? Uh, yeah. or? Let me, but look, real-time AI, the experiments that I have done with brands on the weather company property, we've seen 25 to 30% wow. better effective rate. I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing because now think about it, it's real-time dollars. Right. So you have a dollar to spend instead of it tracking in the past and guessing where someone's going to be. I'm optimizing Bob Lord and what he's doing at that moment at that time. And I get a really great return on my dollar. Now, I've got to be much more sophisticated about how I do that real time optimization. But that's what we're talking about. Um, and I think we're just scratching the surface of this. And, you know, all I can ask, I can ask people, though, let me just ask my agency colleagues and my brand colleagues. I'd love to ask them to, you know, donate their data on a campaign that I could run through the IBM research tool set. Because the more information, Patrick, that I have to actually understand what the nuances are and all of the cohort groups um, and the proxy characteristics, we're, we're finding there's like 250 proxy characteristics underneath segmentation that are influencing how the machine works. Like I have to understand what those proxy characteristics are so that I can actually build tools to mitigate those proxy characteristics, if that makes sense, across the segmentation. Yeah. So the more data I have, the more I can actually build the tool sets to root it out. That's really interesting, Bob. And, and, I, and I just want to ask one last small question here. It feels like with this technology, this should be somewhat easy to apply for, for, for companies. This isn't going to be hard once you guys have done the hard work. Yeah, I, uh, I, Daniel, I think you're right. And I think the offer is uh, utilize the tool set, insert it into your processes. It is not going to be a heavy lift. If anything, it's just going to be another uh, indicator of whether or not what you're pushing out into the community uh, has a bias to it or not. And if it has a bias, this is the suggestions that you have to correct it. So it is kind of, it's there, it's known technology. And that's really why I'm so excited. Like I said at the beginning, we have this moment in time right now where the advertising and media landscape is going through a major change around identification. We have the opportunity to build AI right into the center of how we do marketing and media uh, going forward in the future in an open source world. And I'm really, really excited about the opportunity. Yeah, Bob, it's been great. And it's been great having this conversation with you. I hope people are, are taking note that they're listening, they're paying attention. The opportunity is significant. And by the way, it's an area that I don't know that IBM gets a lot of credit for, but I hope that this is one of the opportunities that it does, that it, you know, you're out there talking on stage at CES at a big event that sometimes enterprise tech companies aren't necessarily thought of at, you know, in, in being involved and, and you're telling a story, something that, by the way, impacts so much of the world's population in, in a really meaningful and material way. So Bob Lord, SVP Worldwide Ecosystems, IBM, thanks again for joining us on another 6.5 uh, insider edition. We love having you and I'm sure we'll be seeing you again on our show soon. Great. Thanks for having me again, guys. Appreciate it. Great stuff. You know, it, it, it is truly incredible the value that IBM research brings to the table. And what I think is so cool is the alignment between uh, Bob and his group and, and his, and the weather channel and how that morphed into doing essentially uh, better advertising that's better for the advertisers and uh, better uh, for the consumer as well, because it's it's reducing bias. Yeah, and here's a funny thing, Pat, is when you're watching commercials now, you notice there's a lot of attention to detail, more quality, more diversity, more thought in how people are positioning various, um, you know, various commercials to make sure that we are being considerate of the world and in the current state. However, I think some of it's being done scientifically, and I think some of it's being done qualitatively. And so what I'm hearing here is the opportunity for us to get away from some of that subjective, qualitative attention to those, you know, the issues and, and societal issues and, and really look at what the data is saying and let technology help. Because with all the data that's out there, 
we have, we know one thing for sure, Pat. You and I know in every business, every industry that we we analyze and advise is that the tech can do it better at scale than any of us ourselves. So it was a great conversation with Bob and. You know, like I said, it's always fun to have him on. Last time we talked to him about something completely different. And uh, he's kind of like us. He's a utility player. He's great, Bob's, you know, great an, Bob's, an, Bob's an east to west guy like us. That's fun. Absolutely, Pat. So uh, without further ado, you know, I want to say thanks to everybody for tuning into this episode of the 6.5 Podcast Insider Edition. We love having our guests. We love bringing all these public companies. Thanks, IBM, for your support and for giving us the chance to talk to Bob uh, after – what I thought was a great CES presentation. Uh, we'll hope to have them soon. Hit that subscribe button. Join us for more podcasts. Of course, our weekly edition and then many insider editions where we have many fascinating executives join our show. But for this edition, Pat, I think it's time that we wave our hands. We say goodbye until we see you next time. Take care.